Hey guys, welcome back. It's time to break down and theorize about Halo Infinite's absolutely brain imploding legendary ending. As you can tell by the length of the video, I have a lot of thoughts and theories. I think I figured out where Chief is teleported to at the end of the game, who the Endless and the Harbinger are, and what might happen in DLC 1, provided that we actually get campaign DLC of course. Now, speaking of that actually, before we even get to the legendary ending, right before Halo Infinite's campaign released, Microsoft filed a patent for something called Halo The Endless. Now, given the tags on the patent page, we can assume that this is campaign DLC. However, there's actually a huge detail in this name, or so I think there is. The colon. Now, just stick with me here, right? When 343 announced Halo Infinite, they were pretty damn insistent that it was just called Halo Infinite, not Halo colon Infinite. There was no colon, so the presence of a colon in Halo The Endless is rather interesting. The absence of a colon in Halo Infinite insinuates to me that Halo Infinite is something of a, a platform, whereas the presence of a colon in Halo The Endless makes me think it's something like a chapter, like an entry into the platform that is Halo Infinite. Granted, I might be massively overthinking this, but I just thought I'd mention it early on so you can kind of keep it locked away in your mind whilst we talk about the really juicy stuff. So, there are actually two bookend bits of narrative courtesy of the Halo Infinite audio logs that both precede and succeed the legendary ending, and honestly, they are both crucial when it comes to explaining it. So, we're going to go through all three of these things in chronological order. Firstly, the preceding audio logs are the banished archaeological findings. These logs are set shortly after the Halos were fired, defeating the Flood at the end of the Foreign Flood War, and in them, 117649 Despondent Pyre, Zeta Halo's monitor, makes a startling discovery on her ring, the Endless. I'll let the logs play now and then briefly summarise them afterwards. The Flood are ended. The reintroduction phase has begun. Countless preserved species have been sent back to start lives anew. Halo was the Forerunner's terrible and ultimate solution to the Parasite's relentless advance. Designed to destroy all sentient life, nothing was allowed to survive. And we were sure that nothing had. We were wrong. Something has been found. Something that should not exist, yet does. I believed that the Flood represented our ultimate test. Our greatest victory. Perhaps I was wrong in my assumptions. To my dismay, it seems we have a new problem. I must investigate more before I bring this to the attention of the Council. How could this have happened? How could we not know of this till now? Xalanin, a species previously uncatalogued. Xalanin, a problem that must be solved. Did my makers know of them? How could they have kept this from me? I have requested counsel. Soon, I will know how to proceed. There is to be a parley. A meeting. Highly unusual. I have moved Installation 07 into sufficient range of air mold. Delegates are en route. From both sides. Unnecessary contingency, considering these unique circumstances. The council has also provided me with an additional and curious directive. We must understand the extent of what their kind can truly endure. There are facilities on this ring quite ideal for conducting such tests. It is time for the silent auditorium to serve purpose once more. So, she finds the Zalanin, an uncatalogued species, on her halo after the firing of the array and ponders whether the foreigners either had no idea of their existence and also their unique halo immune properties or whether they hid them from her. She then moves Zeta Halo near the Endless's homeworld, and the Council, presumably a group of the few surviving living foreigners and also the Monitors, like we saw in the Combat Evolved Anniversary Terminals, organise a parlay with delegates from both species. They also issue Pyre an additional directive. To understand the extent of what the Endless can endure using certain facilities on the Halo perfect for such tests. Now, just a quick side note, given what was done with the ancient humans at the Palace of Pain, something tells me that flood containment facility may just be one of those facilities. I also would not be surprised in the slightest if one of these tests included seeing if the Endless could be infected by the flood. Given their immunity to the Halos, 
Honestly, the first thing that I'd want to know is if the flood could infect them, because if they could, then, well, it's time to come up with a new anti-flood plan. The halos don't work anymore. Do keep in mind though, these are just my theories. This brings us to the legendary ending, which I assume, at least, takes place shortly after the parlay between the Foreigner and Endless Delegates. The audio part of the legendary ending occurs 77 years after the Halos were fired, in 97,368 BC. Although, do note that the actual cutscene of Atriox takes place in the modern day. He didn't time travel, I've seen some people saying this, he, Atriox did not time travel, it's not what happened. Again, I'm going to let the legendary ending play, and then we'll break it down. Are the vessels prepared? The Silex is already, as is the auditorium. Grand Edict, this is most unprecedented. The Endless must be contained. I will inform the Criterion to proceed. They believe we are here to help. It matters not. Today we do what it takes to maintain order, to preserve our truth. Time will forget they ever existed. Time is not a construct we can control. And we cannot allow it to be theirs. bias has been deployed. So, an entirely new foreigner character, the Grand Edict, is preparing the Silexers with Despondent Pyre in which to imprison the Endless. He says they must be contained and that he will inform the Criterion to proceed. Now, the Criterion, I'm assuming, were the foreigner delegates that went to the parley. Despondent Pyre gets confused, saying they believe we are here to help, but the Grand Edict doesn't care. Imprisoning them is to maintain order and to preserve the Foreigner's truth. He intends for time to forget the Endless ever existed. Pyre says that time is not a construct they can control, but he says that it cannot be theirs either. Now, this is either figurative or literal, but more on that in a minute. Once they're imprisoned, the Engineers, presumably the Hurrigox, seeing as they were Foreigner beings, will investigate them and try to understand their secrets, presumably their immunity to the Halos. Fearing the task at hand, the Grand Edict reveals that the Criterion have given the order to deploy offensive bias to aid Despondent Pyre. So, <laughs> a lot to take in there, but firstly, before we continue, a very quick summary of who offensive bias is and why his return is such a big deal for those who might not be aware. During the Foreigner Flood War, the most intelligent AI in existence, who was also in charge of the entire Foreigner military, Mendicant Bias, was corrupted by the Flood, turned to their side, and with him, took most of the Foreigner military. This made the war they were already losing even worse for the Foreigners, so they created Offensive Bias, an AI almost identical in processing power and intelligence to Mendicant, to command what remained of the Foreigner military. Offensive Bias went on to win arguably the most important battle in the history of the galaxy against Mendicant Bias at the Ark, while outnumbered 436.6 to 1. A victory that bought the few surviving foreigners enough time to fire the Halos and defeat the Flood. Now, the last we heard of Offensive Bias was during this event in Halo Salentium that came out in 2013. Nobody has had a clue what happened to him since. He just won the war and then literally vanished from the cannon. But now, we know exactly what happened to him after that incredible victory. But before we get to the theories, we first need to listen to the series of audio logs that follow on from the legendary ending, where Despondent Pyre deciphers runes on stone ring artifacts on her halo, making a shocking discovery. As I explore this world, I find answers that only seem to exist to pose new questions. One thing is certain, this installation was built differently than the others. A myriad of reformation spires can be deployed. Indeed, has been deployed when requested. To complete the circle. To 
and sure its inhabitants are preserved. Or perhaps I should say, detained. Assuredly, many before me have observed these crumbling artifacts, gazed at the landscape in which they sit. How did they feel? There is so much here that I would assume was interpreted as beauty. Or perhaps not. What are these relics to the past? Are they a celebration? Or a warning? Symbols of hope, or something darker? Time continues to be on my mind. I now believe these relics to contain a warning. A message from the past. But from whom? And why? As I look to the sky, I am struck by a thought. This ring. A constant loop. Are we all fated to repeat the sins of the past? I am close to deciphering the runes. Perhaps I will learn who left them. My makers. The Forerunner's greatest fear was understood to be the Great Parasite. The Flood. A scourge that almost wiped out everything. I now believe this hypothesis to be incorrect. Their greatest fear is... was... losing their power. The fear of a master who would become a slave. Enemy within. That is the meaning of the runes carved into this monument. These runes predate me. Older than even the Forerunners. Time moves forward and back again. And I see rings inside of rings. Great circles everlasting. Without beginning or end. Endless. As I say their name, I feel foolish, uninformed, misled. Zeta Halo is more than a weapon and conservation installation. It is a prison, too, hence why it has reformation spires, to ensure that it can remain intact and prevent the detained from escaping. As she further inspects the rings, she finds runes inscribed onto them and begins to suspect they contain a warning, a message from the past, but she doesn't know who from, nor why. She also ponders, while looking at Zeta Halo loop infinitely in the sky, if the Forerunners are fated to repeat the sins of the past. As she deciphers the runes, she realises that the Forerunners' greatest fear was, in fact, not the Flood. Rather, it was losing their power, merely a threat posed by the Parasite. And then, she deciphers the runes. Enemy Within, which is precisely what the runes on the cave wall in the 2018 Infinite Announcement trailer translated to. It turns out these runes predate both her and the Forerunners. Now, the only thing that ever existed on that Halo, on Zeta Halo, that was older than the Forerunners, as far as we know at least, was the Primordial. But it makes no sense for him to be the one inscribing these runes to warn potential future visitors of the Endless, because, I mean, he and the Flood's goal was total assimilation of all life in the galaxy. There'd be nothing left to visit Zeta Halo, so... This, for now, remains a total mystery. Anyways, back to the audio logs, she later becomes infatuated with these ring artifacts that, based on the rune translation, presumably mark the containment site of the Endless, and comes up with the name Endless for the species they relate to, thanks to these rings' infinite looping. Saying their name makes her feel foolish, misinformed, and misled, presumably because the foreigners decided to detain a species that both terrified and confused them on her ring, for her to contain forevermore. Right then, so with all the information presented, I think the first big question here is who, or rather, what the bloody hell are the Endless, and why were the foreigners so scared of them? Well. This is where the theories begin, so just note that anything from here on out isn't solid canon, it's just my theory, so bear that in mind. Right, I am almost convinced that the Endless are Precursor, in some way, shape or form. Let me give my reasons. Firstly, their name, Endless. Granted, their naming seemed, at least, to come from Despondent Pyre's obsession with the infinitely looping stone circles that related to their containment site, 
However, it's an awfully convenient name given what some called the Primordial, who was the last precursor and the first Gravemind. They called him the Timeless One. Maybe that's just a coincidence though. In the legendary ending, the Grand Edict says time is not a construct we can control, and we cannot allow it to be theirs. Now, this could of course be a purely figurative statement referring to the fact that they can't let them seize power and rule the galaxy, thus in a more kind of metaphorical manner, controlling time. But at the same time, pun definitely not intended, it could be literal. See, the Precursor's existence was centred around these scientific philosophical concepts such as the mantle of responsibility, neural physics, and living time. Now, I'm going to be honest, to properly understand these concepts, you need a PhD in philosophy, in physics, and like seven other obscure sciences, but to cut a long and very complicated story short, their belief was that the universe itself was almost a living entity, affected and changed by all that exists within it, all in a way that was just simply incomprehensible to most, if not all, species. They understood the universe in ways that no other species could and likely never will be able to, and using this immense knowledge, they were able to manipulate their concepts of existence, in turn, altering the fabric of the universe, a component of which is time. It's a long shot, don't get me wrong, but I felt it relevant given the Grand Edict's quote. And furthermore, on the topic of neural physics, when you're fighting the Harbinger, who by the way is a Zalanin, or Endless, in regard to the connection that she's trying to create in the centre of the room, the weapon says that the connection is sentient, which gives me the impression that it may be neural physics based. This isn't good, the connection is sentient. I mean, theoretically everything in existence is neural physics based, so this isn't exactly an anomaly, but I just thought that quote was really interesting, especially when trying to make a case for the Endless being Precursor. And funnily enough, in Halo 3, the Gravemind, who considering he was Flood was essentially Precursor 2, used neural physics to open a portal at Mars, which is how he got High Charity to the Ark. So the concept can be used for the transmission of data and matter, it's not entirely out of the question. And you know what, on the topic of the Flood, there's a point in one of the Prisoner Intel audio logs which are about the Banished capturing this combat medic called Lucas Browning to open the Harbinger Silex, in which the Harbinger directly quotes the Gravemind. Please, I, I just want to- Quiet. I shall talk, and you shall listen. No, I shall talk, and you shall listen. Now, if you don't know why this is significant, well, the Flood were born from the corrupted remnants of the Precursors. They are quite literally Precursor, and as I just demonstrated, were able to harness their philosophical and metaphysical concepts such as neural physics. Furthermore, the Harbinger doesn't just say the same word as the Grave Mind, the enunciation and cadence of what she says is near identical to the Grave Mind. Just listen to it again. No, I shall talk, and you shall listen. And then, in the next prisoner log, which picks up directly after that quote, Lucas Browning is talking in total hysterics. Close space, they're off limits, they're still there, they were still there, the only ones. You should feel honored, human. The truth has apparently set you free. Price paid, the sentence given, we never knew. So old, so far. Yeah. Chaklock says his feeble mind cannot contain the power of her words. Almost the exact same thing happened when ancient humans spoke to the Primordial, who, let me remind you again, was the final precursor and the first grave mind. They were sent mad and committed suicide thanks to what the Primordial had told them about the true nature of the Flood. Now, are these just cool little references, or hints at something larger? I'll let you be the judge of that one. Earlier this year, in the book Point of Light, which conveniently was set on Zeta Halo, we also found that some Precursors survived their genocide by the Foreigners, and were sheltered by some who wanted to protect them, before eventually withering away and becoming plant-like entities. Now, this gives us hard confirmation that some regular Precursors survived the Foreigner's genocide on their species and transformed into something else entirely. Maybe the Endless are another example of that. 
It'd explain why the Grand Edict would want them imprisoned, not just because of their immense power, but also because they know the atrocities they committed on them, aka they would unravel the truth that he so wants to preserve. It's also very convenient that the first mention of the Precursors in like god knows how long happens in a book that not only came out the same year as Infinite and technically actually was originally meant to release only a few months after the game came out before it got delayed, but that book is also set on the same Halo ring as the game. I mean, come on, these conveniences are really starting to add up. And you know what, that seems like the perfect segue into talking about what this truth is that the Grand Edict wants to protect and that the Harbinger wants to disprove. And funnily enough, I think, again, this truth links back to the Precursors. I'm 99.9% .9 sure that the Forerunner's lie that the Harbinger wants to bring to an end relates to the mantle of responsibility and of whom that mantle belongs to. So far, the narrative of every single one of 343's Halo games has revolved around the mantle. Halo 4's story was about the Didact trying to seize the mantle from humanity for the Forerunners. Halo 5 was about Cortana seizing the mantle for herself and her created. So, what if Halo Infinite is about the Endless seizing the mantle for themselves? The Harbinger goes on about the Forerunners' lies being at an end, and the Grand Edict seeks to imprison the Endless to preserve their truth. Maybe humanity were never meant to hold the mantle. Perhaps it was originally meant to be the Endless, but because of the power they possessed thanks to their immunity to the Halos, the Forerunners decided that giving them access to these weapons that posed no risk at all to their own kind wasn't the best idea. Doing so would also mean that the Forerunners would relinquish any and all control they still held over the galaxy even after their passing. You see, if the humans got the mantle and became the reclaimers of all their legacy, there was nothing stopping those few foreigners who survived, like the Grand Edict, from firing the Halos, wiping them all out, and allowing them to just come in and reclaim the mantle. Even in the years following their extinction, the foreigners, the builder rate in particular who constructed the Halos, still had a gun pointed at the head of the universe, the trigger of which could be pulled very easily. At any given point, the foreigners were always only a few actions away from eradicating humanity and reclaiming the mantle for themselves. It never happened, but that's not the point. The point is that it was possible. It could happen. Were the Endless to become the Reclaimers, it would not have been possible. I mean, Despondent Pyre quite literally says that the Foreigner's greatest fear wasn't the Flood, it was not being in control. And were the Endless to become the Reclaimers, they wouldn't have been in control. And believe it or not, there may actually be some evidence in-game that supports this theory. Firstly, the Harbinger literally has a Reclaimer symbol front and centre on her helmet. This alone is confirmation, in my eyes at least, that their focus is on the mantle in some capacity. I mean, there's no way in hell that this is a coincidence. Secondly, throughout Infinite, she's able to activate several Forerunner installations without the need of a human. For example, she activates the Spires just fine. Now, granted, this could have just been because she had the monitors in Cephalon to use as like a key or something, I'm not sure, but I don't know, it just seems to fit very conveniently with the Reclaimer symbol on a helmet to suggest it's something more. And thirdly, this line right here, the Endless will ascend. The word ascend has been used by the Didact on multiple occasions in reference to securing the mantle. If you haven't mastered even these primitives, and man has not attained the matter. Your ascendance may yet be prevented. I stand before you, accused of the sin of ensuring foreigner ascendancy. If you ask me, the subtleties in Halo Infinite's narrative are practically screaming at us that the great lie the foreigners preserved and that the endless will shatter is that they were the true holders of the mantle of responsibility, and thus, the true reclaimers. The Harbinger also talks about the Endless being sentenced for crimes not their own. What if the Precursors actually chose a variant of themselves, by this theory, at least the Endless, to hold the mantle, but the Foreigners chose to lie about it? It wouldn't be their fault they were chosen for the mantle, but they were certainly sentenced for it. Oh, and one final little note on this. Probably means nothing, but... I want to mention it anyway, just in case. There's a big thing in this game about plans changing. But this wasn't the mission. The missions change. They always do. 
and the Harbinger literally says that humanity were the culmination of the Forerunner's final plan. The firing of the Halos, and the humans reclaiming the mantle and holding it in their wake, I, I assume. But plans change. Humanity was the culmination of their final plan. The plans change. Humanity was the this to me sounds like her way of saying the Endless have returned to claim the mantle. So moving on, I now want to talk about offensive bias, where Chief ends up at the end of the game, why he ends up there, and DLC 1, presumably titled Halo the Endless. We heard in the legendary ending that the Criterion, what I assume to be the foreigner delegates that met with the Endless, deployed offensive bias to assist Despondent Pyre in detaining the Endless on Zeta Halo. Now, firstly, the fact that the single most powerful AI in existence was deployed to contain the Endless should tell you how much of a threat they pose, presumably thanks to their Halo immunity. I mean, hell, Cortana quite literally says that the Endless pose more of a threat than the Flood, so you can hardly blame the Forerunners for deploying offensive bias to detain them. But to get back to the point, after hearing the legendary ending for the first time, I kind of started to reassess some moments in the campaign where things seemed to happen very spontaneously and very conveniently, and I started looking at them in a completely different light. The first thing was during the Harbinger boss fight. When the weapon is trying to block the connection that Harbinger is trying to open to somewhere else on the ring, she says, Wait, there's something else here. Something's helping me. Now, given the defensive bias was tasked with containing the Endless, of whom the Harbinger is trying to free, it only makes sense for him to block a connection that she's trying to open that relates to freeing them, so this presence helping the weapon has to be offensive bias. Like, it makes perfect sense in my head, I can't see it being anybody or anything else. The next thing is the portal that just randomly opens up once you've killed the Harbinger and the Silent Auditorium starts falling apart. Chief has no escape, the weapon doesn't know what to do, and miraculously, a portal just so happens to open up, saving the one who just put an end to the Harbinger and who also wants to prevent the Endless from being freed. Again, this absolutely has to be offensive bias. Again, I I can't see anyone or anything else that would do this. It just fits way too well. And then there's the location that Chief ends up after going through that portal. Now, remember when Despondent Pyre deciphered the enemy within runes on these rings, and it was heavily suggested throughout the audio logs that they marked the burial slash detainment site of the Endless? Well, I'm 99% sure that this location right here is the detainment site of the Endless. Think about it, right? Offensive Bias was tasked with helping Despondent Pyre, of whom is now dead, contain the Endless, of whom are now free. He's going to be searching for any help that he can get, and after seeing Chief defeat the Harbinger, he'll know that he's up for the task. So, he opens a portal for him to the other side of the ring, to the desert in which the Endless are buried, to assist in ensuring that they don't escape the ring now that Atriox has freed them. The foreigners have always loved burying entities that wrong them in vast deserts. I mean, Mendicant Bias is highly suggested to have been buried in one of the Ark's infinite deserts, possibly even the one that surrounds Epitaph and Citadel in Halo 3. And speaking of Halo 3, Offensive Bias pulling the strings from the shadows to ensure that Chief survives is a direct parallel to Mendicant Bias, who does the exact same thing at the end of Halo 3, ensuring that he doesn't die is Installation 0810 tears itself apart so that it may atone for its sins. I mean, the parallels, the similarities, the connections are all there. So on that note, what about DLC 1? Well, given Halo the Endless, I have a feeling we're going to be in this vast desert fighting and trying to contain the Endless. Hopefully, we'll also meet and get support from Offensive Bias as well. Just saying those words out loud makes my brain explode. But honestly, it all lines up perfectly, if you ask me. Now, what's interesting is that it seems as though we may have already had some teasers for DLC 1 and The Endless. Last year, when the fated Craig demo reveal happened, 343 also released a shorter, more cinematic campaign trailer featuring this shot right here. Now, it goes without saying, but this scene wasn't in the campaign. And then, we fast forward to release, and there's this doll hidden on Zeta Halo. Do those three eyes look familiar to you? Yeah, 
I'm pretty convinced that this thing is an endless, or however you say it, and that this scene is from the campaign, but was cut, and given that the endless aren't in the campaign, I imagine we'll see it again when we get the reveal in DLC 1 or in whatever the hell Halo the Endless actually is. And so, I've just got two quick final things that I want to mention before we round this video out. Firstly, remember that Combat Evolved Anniversary cutscene from like literally 10 years ago at this point that had that mysterious ship that belonged to a totally unknown species crash on Alpha Halo? Well, <laughs> how much do you want to bet that that's going to be resolved as being an endless ship? We still have no resolution for that cutscene whatsoever. It would not surprise me in the slightest if they end up explaining it off as the Endless. And secondly, one slight bit of evidence that could actually disprove the idea that the Endless are Precursor is that when Omega Halo was fired, it destroyed all Precursor artifacts in the galaxy that it was fired in, and also the firing of the regular Halo array also heavily damaged and disabled the domain, which was another Precursor artifact. Now, that doesn't fit with the fact that the Halos can't harm the Endless, but then again, that could just be a case of the Endless being some kind of evolved form of Precursors, or an offshoot of them biologically, or something like that that gives them an immunity. I don't know, it could very easily be explained away that way, I think. And so, that brings this insane theory and breakdown video to a close. If your brain isn't galaxy-sized after this video, then... I don't know, maybe we need to go back to the start and rewatch it, because let me tell you, I wrote most of this video in the early hours of the morning, absolutely wired off coffee, and I swear I ended up seeing into the fourth dimension or something. There were points when I was writing this video, I was like, hang on, this all fits way too well. Maybe it's the coffee talking though. I don't know. <laughs> let me hear your thoughts and everything down below in the comments, I'd love to hear it. And you know what, with that said, it's time to round this video out here. I want to give a massive thank you to Lehman0610 and Scan for becoming new Primordials, and to Brother Buckwheat for becoming a new iconic one over on Patreon. Thank you very much, friendos, I really appreciate that. Along with, of course, everyone else who continues to support me over there. And as well, thank you all so much for watching, I really do appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.